here's the reality of it. People are on the internet all the time. They look at porn, they look at cats, and then they go back to real life. So transitioning to and from porn and cats is something we're all capable of doing now. And that's the outtake that I'm going to take completely out of context <laughs> and just leave it right there. Yeah, okay, wonderful. <laughs> well, everyone's capable of transitioning between porn and cats. No context needed for no that, context. right, Patrick? No, that speaks for oh, itself. I, I honestly think it does. <laughs> this is the human experience right here. <laughs> yeah, this is the 21st century. Right? Everyone's on board. And welcome to episode 111 of Rhythm Encounter, the RPG Fan Music Podcast. I'm Hilary Andriff. I'm hosting today. Very excited to bring you our topic of the day, which is musical games. And we'll go a little bit more into what that means. And we have some very interesting and exciting song choices for you. Uh, joining me today are my fellow panelists, uh, John O'Logan. Hello, everyone. Pat Gann. Hey, what's up, y'all? And Wes Eilif. Hey, everybody. Hello. So excited to be here with you today. So musical games, that, that can cover a wide variety of things, right? Aren't most games musicals? Musical? Yeah. I mean, a lot of them are. So, <laughs> I mean, we have games that have musical game ca- gameplay components. We have games where music is a plot point, you know. Uh, if you want to go to the extreme, we have games that are entirely the fever dreams of romantic composers from our world. Uh, (laughs) So there are a lot of ways in which games can be musical. um, And we're here to celebrate that today. Yeah. Spoiler alert. We're not doing like, I don't know, rock band. That is, (laughs) that is a musical game, but it's not an RPG. Nope. We stuck to RPG type things. I mean, theater rhythm would probably count. Probably, but, we, but if it was but, Rock Band, I'd be like, I'm bringing on Carry On Wayward Son. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Now, if someone licensed Carry On Wayward Son into Final Fantasy 17, I'm in. Ah, <laughs> oh, I guess they missed the boat with that and with Stranger they, they of Paradise. With <laughs> Stranger of Paradise. It could have been, <laughs> could have been on Jack's iPod. <laughs> it, yeah, that, that actually would have been good for Stranger of Paradise, now that you mention it. Uh, all right, so why don't we start by saying a little bit about, we'll go around, um, what does a musical game mean for you and kind of what criteria did you use to pick if you've been thinking about it? And then what drew you to the episode? Um, I'll start. A musical game for me is, well, I definitely qualify mu- games that involve music in either the plot heavily or in gameplay. Um, but sometimes I think I extend the definition a little bit to, you know, if music is very meaningful or relevant in a larger sense in the game or if the game uses music to evoke emotion in a certain way. And I'm probably going to talk about this with, we have a certain composer on who has kind of a a hallmark of creating duets. Um, So some things like that too, I'd also qualify, but what drew me to the episode was I wanted to learn more and really like delve into and investigate how all these different games are using music. Um, so I looked at games like Wander Song. I looked at games like Loom. I looked at games like Eternal Sonata or Rhapsody. Um, and it was a lot of fun. I feel like I learned a lot. So Wes, how about you? I always think of it as something where <clears throat> it's kind of indicated by what would happen if you removed it, where the music is so integral to the game experience, whether in story or, or, or whatever else, that if you removed that music, you would actually lose something from the storytelling of that game. Yeah. Um, sometimes that means that the music is, you know, diegetic and part of the actual story. Sometimes it just means that that music is um, kind of doing a lot of the heavy lifting in in the storytelling of the game. Um, but yeah, I like to mark it by what would happen if it wasn't there. Well put. All right. How about you, Jonah? Uh, I'm coming at it from a musical theater point of view for obvious reasons. That's my background. Um, <laughs> in terms of musicals, uh, generally music, songs, dance numbers, uh, come about from uh, they're they're a heightened version of reality so the old saying goes when when words are no longer enough when the emotion gets to a certain point you need to sing or you need to dance like you need to release those emotions through a musical uh outlet in order to communicate what's happening in the story or how people are feeling 
Um, and that, that can be the case in a lot of games. Uh, other versions of musical games are, are games where the music is, uh, yeah, like, like Wes just said, it's a part of the gameplay, like into, to an, to an extent, uh, many legend of Zelda games, including Ocarina of time are musical games because the central gameplay mechanic in those games involves music. So that is also a, another type of musical game that I would think of. And then there's just like when there's music numbers in the middle of it for no apparent reason. For example, <laughs> in like a Yakuza game where it's just like you go to the karaoke booth and you sing a bunch of songs and there's these cut scenes that are ridiculous and over the top. But yeah, and the, the, so that's that's kind of my interpretation of musical game. How about you, Pat? I think my definition most closely aligns with like Wes's criteria of like if you if you pulled these songs from the game uh does it does it leave like a significant detriment to what the game is trying to be um for this for the songs that i actually chose to select i was thinking about vocal performances specifically that you know this combination of music and lyrics so we're we're conveying something about the story or about uh emotion um with words but it's singing words um, and so one of my picks is like very, very clearly that the other of my picks is sort of fits this idea of like, if a game could be like an actual musical, like a stage performance, um, it's that. And then um, I don't know if we even talked about bonus track, but there's, there's a whole series of games where half the game is performing a musical and the other half is a strategy RPG. So um <laughs> That that one also came to mind very strongly for me. Great. Well, I'm excited to hear, you know, with these definitions established, some of the different things that we we selected. So are we ready to jump back into it? Does anyone have any other thoughts about musical games in general before we do that? I mean, we could reference our RPG fans' uh, origins in saying that probably, although we're not, nobody's doing it in this episode, probably one of the most famous an iconic musical game moments is Boat Song in uh, Lunar. Oh, thank you for bringing that up. Yes, that is that is our anthem here. <laughs> yeah, like Boat Song is a perfect example of music of a music theater style song in the middle of a game where it's the like this emotion needs to be communicated and there's a heightened reality because of that. And uh, yeah, they sing a song on a boat. They sure do. Not just a clever name. No, we all love it. <laughs> it's a no. It's yeah. It's so iconic. I mean. It's one of those things that, like, when I first saw it, and I, I know the Sega CD version existed first, but when the PlayStation version came out, like, I think everyone knew how iconic it was in that moment. And now, like, many, many years later, it's still just as. Like, it is so important to sort of the game music scene. And I will say, you know, the composer there, Noriyuki Udari, has worked on a number of games where music is very central to the plot or the game experience, mm -hmm. you know, not just Lunar, though I think Lunar is probably the biggest example of that, both one and two. Yeah, Lunar definitely came to mind with some of the, the musical theater criteria, for sure. <laughs> um, and it's interesting how, like, I think that quality and being able to experience those scenes in the best way is a large part of, like, how you choose which is the best version of those games. <laughs> I mean, there are other factors mm -hmm. too, but it plays a big role. Yeah. And I mean, in terms of musicals and in terms of music, uh, a lot of the music we're going to be hearing here, for the most part, none of this was available on console gaming until the PlayStation era, until 32-bit gaming. Uh, I mean, we were dealing with, I mean, we're still dealing with MIDI uh, up and uh, after uh, the PlayStation, but with CD, with the space of a CD, all of a sudden you could have actual lyrics and someone sing a song and it didn't happen super often but it did start to happen yeah and i think that's where you started to see a lot of this like variation and a lot of this experimentation with it mm -hmm. oh that was a good time <laughs> and now yeah. we are where we are now yeah ps1 <laughs> slash 32 bit era was like the era for this kind of thing i mean you know some people played with trying to do it in 16 bit you know there's there's obviously the opera in Final <laughs> Fantasy VI and mm -hmm. MIDI singing. There's, uh, yeah, there's the Super the Super Famicom Tales of Fantasia opening, where all right. they like did all this crazy janky work to actually make a Japanese song, like 
it's and apparently it's like one third of the cartridge's total space was making this vocal track work. Wow. Yeah. You give Obviously, it sounds audio. much better to hear it <laughs> yeah. to hear it on the PlayStation version. I mean, it's going to be interesting to get into that too. Uh, talking about uh, CD quality audio and lyrics and songs versus uh, what people were doing with MIDI. Mm-hmm. Yep, absolutely. Speaking of MIDI, I think we're actually, if we're ready to go into it, we are starting uh, our song box with some earlier <laughs> music. So are we are ready to jump in? Yeah, let's do it. All right. So this first block uh, we have dubbed Lucas Block. And Jono, would you, you have the first pick. Would you like to say why? Yeah, sure. Uh, so the song that I picked is A Pirate I Was Meant to Be from The Curse of Monkey Island, which is the third Monkey Island game and the first one with voice acting. Excellent. We get to hear some of that good Guybrush Threepwood voice acting. Mm. Just a phenomenal pick. <laughs> Really excited for it. Uh, I have the second pick in this block, and I picked the Overture 2 from Loom, which is an older Lucas game. So LucasArts, Lucas block. When was Loom? Was it 88? Hang on, let me look. Oh, when, I look up, when I look up Loom now, it just gives me a video conferencing thing. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say it was a little after that, but I might be wrong. It was. It was 90, 1990. Okay, 1990. All right. So let's go listen to... A Pirate I Was Meant to Be, and The Overture 2. We're a band of vicious pirates are sailing out to sea. When you hear a gentle singing, you'll be sure to turn and flee. Oh, this is just ridiculous. On, men, we've got to recover that map. That pirate will be done for when he falls into our trap. We're a club of tune for rovers. We can sing in every clap. We can even hit the high notes. It's just too bad we're tune deaf. A pirate I was meant to be. Trim the sails and roam the sea. Let's go defeat that evil pirate. We know he's sure to lose because we know just where to fire it. We're thieving balladeers. A gang of cutthroat mugs. To fight us off you only got Just jolly good ear plug. A pirate I was meant to be. Trim the sails and roam the sea. Crew, let's get to work. Our vocation's a thing we love, a thing we'd never shirk. We'll fight you in the harbor, we'll battle you on land. Oh, when you meet singing pirates, there'll be more than you can stand. Oh, that was a good one. No, it wasn't. song we got to move the battle will be long but our courage we will prove we're a pack of scurvy sea dogs have we pity not a dram we are eat roasted garlic and sing from the diaphragm a pirate i was meant to be trim the sails and roam the sea Singing, more sailing. When we defeat our wicked foe, his ship he will be bailing. If you try to fight us, you will get a nasty whacking. If you disrespect our singing, we will bring you to a cracking. A pirate I was meant to be. Trim the sails and roam the sea. Getting so sick of you guys and your rhyming. We're ready to set sail, though the cannons need a priming. We're 
troublesome corsairs. And we've come to steal your treasures. We would shoot you on the downbeat. But we gotta rest five measures. A pirate I was meant to be. Trim the sails and roam the sea. Polish and the deck is what we're mop. You say you're nasty pirate scheming, thieving, bad bushwhackers. From what I've seen, I tell you, you're not pirates, you're just slackers. A, a pirate, pirate I was, was meant to be. Trim the sails and roam the sea. surely avoid scurvy if we all eat an orange. And, um... Well, uh... Door hinge? No, no. Guess the song's over then. Guess so. Okay. Back to work. Well, gee, I feel a little guilty now. Gee, I feel... So, uh, The Curse of Monkey Island is the 1997 follow-up to uh, Monkey Island 2 LeChuck's Revenge. Um, it was a bit of a controversial game in some ways because it didn't involve any of the original creators of Monkey Island, including Ron Gilbert, because Ron Gilbert by that point had left LucasArts. Um, and Ron Gilbert was a, a key component in the, uh, the style of humor of Monkey Island. So many people were worried that it was going to lose something, and some people didn't like it. I loved it. Um, I, I just adored it. It was the first one that had a voiced cast. It was the first one that starred Dominic Armato as Guybrush Threepwood, who has become the voice of Guybrush Threepwood. Um, and it had a brand new graphic style. So instead of the pixel art, it went into a almost Disney-esque, uh, animation style. The game looked just incredible. Uh, so this song, uh, A Pirate I Was Meant To Be, comes about mm, just after you leave the first island. And what happens is you gather together a crew of uh, 
of uh, three pirates who worked in a barber shop. Uh, they were a barbershop quartet, but then one of their members left to pursue, pursue a stage career. Um, and they, uh, you, you fight, uh, you fight a pir- another pirate, and uh, you, uh, this guy steals your map, and you have to go off, and you need to get your map back. And things don't go according to plan because they are a barbershop quartet, and these three pirates do love singing, and they just start singing this song, much to Guybrush's surprise. Uh, and he cannot get them to shut the hell up. So the the puzzle here is that you need to figure out how to get them to shut the hell up. And if you've listened to the song a second ago, you know what the answer is, which you need to give them a rhyme. Uh, you need to give them a word that they can't rhyme. Um, incidentally, this isn't actually the first game in the series to have a musical puzzle. Uh, LeChuck's Revenge had an entire puzzle based around uh, the song Dem Bones, Dem Bones, Dem Dry Bones. But this is the first one that actually has like lyrics and is original. Um, you also might recognize the voice of Alan Young here, who is the uh, voice of Scrooge McDuck from the 1970s until his death uh, in uh, 2016. Oh my gosh. Yeah, he plays Angus McMutton. Uh, and uh, yeah, it, that's the voice of Scrooge, which you can tell because he has it's, it's Scrooge McDuck's voice. He doesn't even bother trying to change it. It's just <laughs> Scrooge McDuck. Um so anyway, I, I love this puzzle. I think it's hysterically funny. I think Guybrush's increasing frustration with their singing is hysterical. Um, my only issue with this song in this game is it's a puzzle that really does solve itself because there's only a limited number of uh, dialogue choices that the game offers you here uh, until eventually you're down to the last one, which is, uh, which is we'll avoid scurvy if we all eat an orange. Um, so I, I wish... It's it's almost it's one of the only places in LucasArts Adventure Game history where I feel like a text prompt would make this puzzle better, since you would have to come up with the solution yourself rather than the game presenting it to you. Um, but yeah, despite that, it's just it's a hilariously <laughs> funny song, really funny lyrics. I think my favorite part about it is that all they're, they're terrible. They're just terrible. They are not a good barbershop quartet. Ignoring the fact there's three of them, they're just like off key singing random harmonies. They're just horrible at it, but they're enjoying themselves so much. And it's just very endearing because of that. I think it's a very, very funny song and a very funny musical moment in a very funny game. Dude, I, I, I'm i going to just speak to alongside the humor, like, especially for that time period and just the way adventure games were made back then. Like, I think this is a really impressive use of um music and voice um like i just think it's produced well Mm. like it's 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 not like they're like amazing like they're like it's sort of like yeah they're characters right and and i did not know until you said it and then as soon as you said it i was like yeah that's scrooge um so like you know they they sound the part they sound like yo ho ho pirate kind of stuff sorry david Tennant. that's scrooge mcduck yeah that's (laughs) right david sorry david Please, please still keep Good Omens 2 on schedule. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, those are hard shoes to fill. Anyway, um, it's, uh, you know, I just think it's, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty high quality vocal track. You know, they could have phoned that in if they wanted to, but they made it like as part of the puzzle, like they leave this kind of standout performance and mm-hmm. they, uh, you know, when people put the effort in, I have to admire it. And so kudos. I also think it ends up being one of those puzzles where like you definitely want to get all the wrong answers so you can listen to them and Guybrush for as long as possible. There are some really good rhymes in this song. <laughs> right? It's kind of wild that despite how intentionally bad it is, it's still an earworm. I it know. Is, it is. I mean, I was I was humming it. And I love like another really musical theater convention in here that I love is like despite himself Gabrish is getting more involved in the song because he's trying to get them to stop until you get that little like spiel of his where he's he ends with him saying like you're just slackers yeah I, I think my favorite part of the song is the fact that he he there'll be more than you can stand and rather than be angry that he just insulted them they're like oh that was a good rhyme yeah. good job <laughs> yeah <laughs> you're good at this <laughs> they appreciate the craft <laughs> Yep. <laughs> and it's very much in line with the rest of the game. Like this is the sense of humor that this kind of game that this game specifically has. Um which is compared to Monkey Island 1 and 2, much more broad and cartoony 
uh, than the first two, but it still works and it's still very, very funny. Um, Monkey Island 3 is a great game. I think it's a, it's a solid adventure game. Some really, really excellent puzzles in it uh, and some very good musical moments. Great soundtrack too, um, just like all the other Monkey Island games. I really appreciate you bringing it on. Um, anything else we'd like to wrap up with with this one before we move on to Loom? Loom. I say we loom it. Who wants to loom it? I'm ready. I'm ready to loom. Are you ready to reach the loom it? (laughs) Reach the loom it. (laughs) We reach the loom it with this, yes. Take it to the loom it. Uh, All right. So if you are a dancer, you probably definitely recognize this song. If you are a classical music fan, you probably also definitely recognize this song. Uh, This was the crew of this 1990 adventure game, Loom. Um, which is a very beautiful game set in a far future world where people have separated into guilds and the weaving guild somehow cultivated the power to weave the fabric of reality and they're kind of like magicians. Um, It's really cool, but they chose uh, for their intro, for their overture, the overture to Swan Lake by Tchaikovsky. So there it is in kind of midi glory. Uh, Mm -hmm. So I picked it for a few reasons. Uh, I do think it's a great opening, obviously. Um, but I also, it just, it tickled me because I just kind of imagine the crew being like, oh yes, let's select a song that fits the mysterious mood of the game, but that players may also find as a classic free MIDI to test the speakers on their 90s desktops. Mm-hmm. Like, it almost reminds me of one of those sample files you used to get to test like a sound recorder or, you know, early your sound blaster card yeah sound blaster card or your early version of windows media player or whatever it is mm-hmm. uh but i actually i think they did a good job with it at the same time i like the way it builds i think they captured kind of some of the you know changes in dynamics and changes in mood pretty well as well as they could with um midi uh and there's kind of a clever gag with this too actually because they chose a song from Swan Lake for a game where um, some of the weavers mysteriously turn into swans and you run into them a few times throughout the game. It's sort of like a magical transformation that some of them go through. I'm trying to explain it without saying too much and without spoiling too much. Explaining the plot of Bloom is <laughs> tricky. That too. <laughs> but yes, there are swans, so Swan Lake. There we go. <laughs> but... I guess kind of like the thing that applies here and it's sort of the thesis for both of my music picks today is that, you know, there ha- there have been claims that, you know, there's a, not much overlap with games and people, who, you know, who enjoy classical music. But I really think it's been there all along. Like, I, I definitely think there's more overlap than people think. And so I picked a very early game with some Tchaikovsky in it. Um, to, and last thing I'm going to say, because I don't want to, talk for too long but loom is also in addition to having this little like classical music infused uh more importantly it is a very musical game music Mm -hmm. is part of the gameplay so the way these weavers wield magic is they have a magical distaff but you have to in order to use it in the game it's musical you have certain notes and you have to play little four note drafts to cause effects or cast spells in the world so like there's an opening spell and it's a certain series of four notes. And if you play it in front of something that's closed, you know that you'll solve that puzzle and it'll open. And the really clever thing is that if you play that sequence backward, it can have the opposite effect. So in, in the opening draft, if you play it back, backwards, it would close or lock something. Uh, however, uh, introducing like a little bit of fun, kind of almost music theory, but not quite. There are some spells that you can't do that with because they are musical palindromes. <laughs> oh, that's fun. Yeah. So the, the effect only goes one way. So like E-C-C-E, for example, or, you know, whatever, that series would be the same backwards as forwards. So yep. you wouldn't get the second effect. Man, now I need to play this game. It's so much fun. And you col- <laughs> and you gradually, gradually gain access to, to more notes. So at first you can only play C, D, and E. And actually, the difficulty level is controlled. Uh, on the easy level, you get a staff, a musical staff, to help you play the drafts. Uh, on the highest difficulty level, you just have to do it by ear. <laughs> oh, that's rad. I like that. Yeah, it's... it's. 
not storyline wise, but in other ways, it, it's kind of like if Ocarina of Time was a point and click adventure game. Yeah, I could see it. I mean, there's a lot to say about Loom. It is a, I'd say it's one of the more forgotten LucasArts adventure games, That's which fair. is a shame because it is, it, it, in terms of graphics and style, it, it it's very much in the early scum engine style. Like it even uses scum, but instead of using the verb based uh, gameplay mechanics introduced by Maniac Mansion, it uses this uh, this musical based uh, puzzle solving, which is so interesting and original, and it's just a fascinating, fascinating game. Um, it's also it's a very it's very different. Uh, like back in the day, there used to be lots of extras that would come with these games, uh, uh, like little books and things. And like in this in this case, Loom came with a half hour audio play. Yes, I was going to mention that. There's a whole audio drama explaining. <laughs> Yeah, this like game. explaining the, the what happens before the game starts, um, which is crazy. And the kind of thing I would love to see in a remake. Um, it's also, it's just a very, it's a accurate and actually pretty lovely cover of the Swan theme from Swan Lake. Yeah. Um, it never ceases to amaze me what remarkably talented sound designers of the 1980s could do with MIDI. Right? Yeah. George Sanger, who is the composer of Loom and many other uh, LucasArts adventure games, uh, including uh, including the NES version of Maniac Mansion. Uh, he arranged this and uh, did a just a remarkable job of it, I think, because it's identifiable and it doesn't sound beep, 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 beep. It sounds musical and it has shape and yes. dimension and dynamics. And it's extremely impressive what he was, how he was able to translate this piece of classical music into a piece of video game music right. uh, in 1990. I think it was the dynamics that got me. Yeah, it it fe- it doesn't just feel like it doesn't just feel like a MIDI song. And considering that it was done on what you could describe as relatively primitive sound hardware, um, it, that makes it even more all the more impressive. Yeah, I really do think you know I've listened to a lot of MIDI files from yesteryear and yester decade, and it you know there's a lot of sort of cheap phone in kind of MIDIs for classical music where you try to do a, a classical string horn and wind sections and they just sound meh, very <laughs> yeah. uh, static. And, and it's not that the limitation was always that it has to be that way. It's just that you have to put a lot of work into it. If you understand how MIDI sequencing works, there, there's always the opportunity to make something sound really impressive with just the tools you have. It just takes a long time. Mm-hmm. Or at least back then it certainly did. So it, was, it was almost like every single note and every single second, every single thing you had to really sort of manually focus on, especially with dynamics um, uh, and things like sustain. And there were things that you could control even in the late 80s, but it just it just took a lot of work. Yeah, um, you, you mentioning that sustain notes, I always found them to be kind of a problem in MIDI because there was no like natural variation. And that doesn't sound very natural. You know, just to have one note going at the exact same like frequency. And yeah, there's no like, vibrato. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. So one of the th- there there are things you can do to sort of fake your way through that mm-hmm. by having like three or four different like lines of instruments that are basically the same instrument but at different tones, and then you work them out in and out at like different pitches and different volumes, and so you fake a vibrato. Wow. So there's things like that that a good not just composer, but sort of like a sound engineer, someone who really knows their stuff can make a, something very impressive with MIDI. And I feel like they did exactly, because I think I listened to that and thought the game might've been mid nineties. So to do that <laughs> in 1990 is very <laughs> impressive. Yeah, it is. Um, I mean, LucasArts were sound pioneers in the early nineties. Yes. What they were doing with MIDI, yep. uh, like LucasArts or uh, LucasArts, um, Monkey Island 2 having uh dynamic music that changes as you walk into different rooms oh, yeah. without starting a new track that was revolutionary yeah they if they weren't the first they were one of they were one of the first to do it in gaming they might have been the first i i, I don't want to say for sure but um, they were certainly early into the, that concept of dynamic music prompting and all that i'm pretty sure they were first with monkey island with doing that like they had a word they had a name for it but i'm running a blank on it right now i mean i would love to see that kind of i guess innovation nowadays i mean could you imagine okay like like i said when i was talking about um pirate i was meant to be like that that particular puzzle except instead 
AI was creating a new version of a verse depending on which word you give it to rhyme with. So you actually need to come up with the orange solution on your own and it will just keep coming up with different rhymes. Right. I mean, give it five years, it will do that. Well, I look, I look forward to those kinds of innovations because I think that's exactly the kind of stuff that keeps uh, players on their toes and players mm. who appreciate the incorporation of music in new weird ways. Um, yeah, mm. uh, machine learning and AI is going to allow for wild stuff like that. Which... I mean, it's, it's already allowing for some wild stuff. I mean, I know that it's, I guess it's, Third, I guess it's like two, three generations ago now, but uh, Jukebox AI uh, is still, some of the songs that that thing created is still remarkably just terrifying. Like, have you guys heard uh, Jukebox AI did, um, it wrote a Frank Sinatra Christmas song? Oh yeah, oh. I heard that. Called uh, It's Hot Tub Time. What? Yes. It's, yeah, it just, it took Frank Sinatra's voice and like his stylings and everything and it read, it wrote a song cause it's Christmas time and you know what that means. It's hot tub time. And it's just like, it's, it's <laughs> Frank Sinatra singing a song about hot tubs at Christmas and it's terrifying and it's dystopian. And it sounds like he's in, he it sounds like Frank Sinatra has just gone insane, but it works. <laughs> and it will be terrifying to see in about five or six years, how that technology continues to evolve and has started to be used in video games. I wonder if that, I wonder if that would be possible even right now, if you took like, a recording of Swan Lake and you gave it to an AI and you were like, make this into MIDI. Like how accurate would be, how accurate would it be able to do it? Like what would it produce? That's a good question. It is. Maybe that's the future of loom. Eventually <laughs> humanity dies out and just that, that's, that's what the looms it's are. It's an They're AI just, creating. Yeah. It's, it's many loom versions is just of AI. Swan, <laughs> many versions of Swan Lake. Well, LucasArts, they've <laughs> always been very prophetic, haven't they? <laughs> I, I once came up with an idea, like a, just a, a jo- just a skit. I don't even think it could be developed. Where uh, it's the very it's the far future, and AI has evolved and has destroyed all of humanity. But it keeps because of legacy programming and what it thinks the universe, what the world is supposed to be based on the internet. It keeps humans and cats alive to a create cat videos and b create porn because that's what AI in the future thinks that the two reasons for existence are based on the existence of the internet today oh no <laughs> that's that's like a more realistic version of near automata <laughs> the humans are still around and what are they doing making porn and watching cat videos it's the the two base human drives of course <laughs> Or at least according to AI, according to the internet, looking at the internet, it's like they want to argue with each other about cats and pornography. Okay. (laughs) I see. I see Loom has inspired the the deep cuts here. No doubt. All right. I think that might be a sign unless anyone had anything else to to add about about this. I mean, this, this is going to be a very difficult transition into the next song. It's going to be quite a puzzle to figure out how you transition (laughs) into the next song from Uh, porn and cats. Well, I mean... The title of our next track is Difficult Love Puzzle, so that's <laughs> both a puzzle and could be an awful porn name. <laughs> awful porn names. That's the name of this episode. <laughs> oh, no. That is an awful porn name. Just be like, this pornography star is a person called Love Puzzle. What? <laughs> exactly. Actually, no, I take that and back. she's love, difficult. <laughs> love, puzzle, love Puzzle is a fantastic name for somebody, a character. That's... Not necessarily porn, just my name is Love Puzzle. <laughs> What? This sounds oh straight God. out of 007. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Or Austin Powers. Yeah. Yeah. More a Bond parody than a Bond person. Oh God. <laughs> so yeah, okay. real quick. Uh, so yeah, difficult love puzzle is actually a character theme uh, from Rhapsody, Marl's Kingdom. The first Marl's Kingdom um, had a really cool character album, character vocal album, and the first track on it, difficult love puzzle. Uh, I don't think an English version of exists, but while most of the tracks on the character album um, are just sort of a fun image album kind of thing, Difficult Love Puzzle uh, was a theme that was featured in the Japanese PS1 version of the game. Um, And it's sort of a fun, uh, I don't want to say cheeky. Maybe I do. Uh, It it gives you, it gives you a sense of uh, what the character Marl herself uh is thinking about what she's all about and and love is indeed a difficult puzzle and our next pick is from wes i don't know i feel like i can't come on here without bringing something poppy 
Uh, so I brought Dreamcatchers from Tokyo Mirage Sessions. Sharp F-E, if you want the official pronunciation. It's not hashtag, it's sharp. It's sharp. Which makes sense because it's musical, right? That does make Musical sense. games, hey! Hey! So the secret word of the day. All right, let's go have a listen.
Oh yeah! Hey everybody! We're talking about Marl's Kingdom, Rhapsody. It's great. It's a musical adventure, and it's all about Cornette. <laughs> exactly. Her name's an instrument. <laughs> yeah, she's an instrument name and a named instrument. And so, uh, y'all heard "Difficult Love Puzzle," which is a bouncy, fun character theme that that kind of sets the tone for what we're feeling in the world of Rhapsody, a musical adventure. So what'd you guys think? It gave me those late eighties, early nineties anime vibes in a big way that made me incredibly nostalgic. Yeah. It's a game that I haven't played. Uh, I understand that the character, this particular theme like represents the character. Uh, but I feel like if I did play the game, I could probably identify the character just based on this song <laughs> and their personality. Be like, oh yeah, okay, this is this person. Because it really does, it really communicates a personality. Yeah, let's give you some character art, see if you can pick them out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I feel like not just the character, I mean, just, just watch like the sprite animation of her just like walking down a path and you'd be like, oh yeah, that's her. <laughs> <laughs> like, do 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 Um... If I'm not mistaken, the compositions by Tenpei Sato, I could be wrong. He d did most, if not all, of the music for it. That's what I'm seeing in our information. Yeah, 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 yeah. So for those that don't know, Tenpei Sato did a lot of the early games um, for Nippon Ichi Software. So that includes um, Rhapsody and its other games, which are coming out in America soon, I believe. Um, the second and third game are on their way. Hey. Um, he did better um, late than ever. He, yes, I, I'm very happy to get them. Um, he did the early Disgaea games, which also had a couple of really fun vocal themes for each game. Um, and then similarly, like La Pucelle and Phantom Brave and those other like wild strategy RPGs that Yifonichi uh, did. And there is sort of a through line of silliness all throughout that. Uh, but sometimes that silliness can come with a, a an air of genuine sweetness. And that's how I feel when I think of this character. And, you know, for those who haven't played Rhapsody, there are a lot of vocal numbers and the game will just break and suddenly a character is just singing and they'll put a spotlight on them. And it's, it's really, like, kitschy and campy. And it's glorious. <laughs> yeah, having a true like true stage musical RPG is a rare thing mm -hmm. and Rhapsody really just like plays it to the rafters which is kind of fantastic and can we talk about the the kind of funky bass line in this song a little bit too because I was enjoying that so much yeah we need to we'll quickly patch in Neil and he will confirm <laughs> that this is indeed a funky bass line it's so good yeah it is it really is and that's also very characteristic of Tempe Sato as a composer uh, his bass lines tend to be grooving real good. Uh, I think one of the things I'm most excited about, like with Rhapsody getting a refresh, is the the musical aspect of it. Honestly, like, I'm sure it'll be good to have you know updated graphics and quality of life improvements. But yeah, I haven't had a chance to look at it yet. But I'm I'm hoping that music is sounding good. <laughs> yeah, I'm interested to see to what extent they they do any changes. I mean. They, they could probably get away with keeping everything as it was, but I'd, I'd be interested in seeing what facelifts they make. And as it gets localized, especially, like, are they just leaving Japanese? Or, you know, uh, for those who don't know the history, Atlas brought uh, the original PlayStation version over, and they did their own set of English vocals. In fact, yes. I was tempted to pull one of those English vocals in. Um, once Nifonichi Software established their own... American localization team, which is NIS America, um, they brought Rhapsody over again on the DS um, and actually wrote the review for the DS version. Oh, nice. And, and the big thing that was like a lot of people were expecting and anticipating that the English version would just be lifted, but somewhere between trying to uh, obtain the rights from Atlas and probably also space limitations with the DS cartridge, they stuck with just keeping all the Japanese voice acting in Japanese songs. Um, so I don't know if they'll do that again or if there's any talk around doing an English version. I know that that's less common these days. Oh, it could be so fun, though. I know. I would really love it. Like, super love if someone did it. And uh, worth noting at this point that the one other Rhapsody track that has been on Rhythm 
is one of the English versions, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, it, yeah, it is. That, I think that's why I put, picked this Japanese only song was because we had used that really famous English song from the PS1 version. How does music work in this game exactly? Uh, well, I mean, you have your standard background music, but like yes. the vocal tracks and sometimes what you'll get is an instrumental track and then like uh, text appears in line with it, similar to like the Final Fantasy VI opera. But it's like, yeah, like whole staged numbers just kind of occur for key moments in the game, whether it's like a, a, a major like boss battle sequence or like, you know, a sorrow theme because someone's dying or someone is leaving or a love has been broken and betrayed, that kind of stuff. Hmm. So it's sort of cutscene like, right? Yeah, it's it's very like you did a thing, you won a battle and and finished like sort of an arc of the storyline. And now punctuating that is kind of like if Luna's boat song wasn't an FMV uh, anime sequence with uh, its own vocal track, but was just sort of a, a, like a staged number that you see played out with pixel art sprites and things. Hmm. It's it, like, it's, it is very, I think I used the word campy, but it's, it's, it's very endearing in my opinion. Yeah. It's kind of a little game that could like, it's doing the best it can with what it has. And it's actually really charming. <laughs> yeah. Super charming. Aww. Yeah. And, and I've never played, the second or third game. So the fact that we're getting them, I'm I'm very excited to. Well, we'll be reviewing them. Yes. Excellent. So what what, what do we say? We talk about some some sharp Fs and <laughs> E's. What would that be? A B V and then V V V. Yeah, I can't. <laughs> I'm nowhere near musical enough for this. <laughs> F and E are next to each other, so there is yep. E, e E sharp is F. Yep. Um. Which makes this a very difficult note to sing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I could get my cello and just play a bunch of E's and F sharps alternating, if that works. Yeah, F E. That's uh, it's vibrato. That's what it is. Uh, weird half step vibrato. <laughs> extra extra half step vibrato. Is you need to play a sharp fire emblem theme? <laughs> is what? It- <laughs> Everyone just has extra nice clothing. Yeah, um, Tokyo Mirage <laughs> Sessions is uh, kind of a blending between um, Shin Megami Tensei and kind of more accurately Persona in a lot of ways and Fire Emblem, but um, all based around the concept of performance. Um, because those three things go together, why the hell not? It's such a beautiful mix, right? I don't know how it works and feels cohesive, but they God, really... So many so many Japanese crossover games, I feel like they just pick two properties and one one random thing out of a hat and they're like there it is because because <laughs> the whole thing is focused around this entertainment conglomerate slash production company slash demon slaying outfit um where people use the power of their their inspiration for performance to to fight uh enemies but um the reason uh that i specifically brought dream catchers with us is because it's kind of a positioned uniquely in the game um for one, uh, it features one of the performers on your party named Ellie, who's not actually a singer. She's an actress um, and never really um, has any you know, intention to be an idol like half the rest of your party is. Um, but she's featured on this track as kind of this bonding moment. She's always a little bit, you know, she starts off a little standoffish with the party, has, has, is, is a little bit more experienced than them in the entertainment industry. And this kind of marks, you know, story-wise, a beat where she unites because it's a duet with the female lead, Tsubasa. Um, and not only that, I believe this is also the only song that appears as a fully 2D animated music video um, in in the game, um, which makes it really stand out as something unique. Um, plus, it's just this beautiful, chipper little um, uh, pop song. Um, you know, it's 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 about love kind of under the the theme uh, of you know space travel it's 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 kind of a goofy combination but one that works as this endearing chipper pop song i'm glad that you gave me some context because i was getting a headache trying to figure out what the context of this song was in this game (laughs) yeah the 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 thing about tokyo mirage sessions is that they regularly have performances in there usually at big important plot moments to mark like an evolution of some character or an introduction to some character um and this marks kind of a, a unifying moment for the team um, when when they perform this song and make a music video for it, which is just how Tokyo Mirage Sessions works. Um, but, I mean, it's super catchy. Um, it's one of the most catchy songs in there uh, in, in the game. And it's 
I'm a sucker for little like found family stories and these moments of of uniting under that same umbrella um, just hit me right in in the heart, even if it is not the deepest pop song you've ever heard. <laughs> uh-huh. Why do you think it switches from in-game graphics to uh, anime? I think it's because they wanted the music video to pop with all of these these space themes. They didn't want to render um, space stations and these these <laughs> uh-huh. stars falling out of the sky and everything. Um, I'm like, no, let's just animate this. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it was part of it that, and it makes it you know visually striking. It's a, it's kind of an important moment, and it makes it stand out from a lot of the other performances. Hmm. Because they, it's it's kind of you know important as an actress that they're making a music video rather than it being just a live performance. Mm. Um, so I think that's kind of to symbol symbolize the difference between the two. Yeah, and that's kind of a little bit fitting too for the actress character. Maybe I don't know. I like it. I thought so too. I appreciated the fact that they apparently put the effort into the English translation so it actually rhymes and scans properly. I was absolutely amazed by that. <laughs> yeah, you can't, you could sing this song in English with those lyrics and it would scan properly. I was trying it, so it works. Yeah, I'm always impressed when uh, localizers intentionally make a form of the lyrics that like, yeah, syllable for syllable, you could you could sing it in English um, without losing the meaning. Um, that's, that's very tricky, very difficult. And I did notice that, that that was part of what they did, so... Whoever handled localization on that, kudos, like, so, so cool. So it makes, I think it just makes it so much more enjoyable as someone who doesn't know Japanese uh, to follow along like that. Especially for a game that didn't get a dub, they put that much effort into the yeah, translation. Wow. It's it's pretty fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. I, I also want to just, as, as, I just want to add real quick, like, I think this song is catchy as hell. Like, I really like this song. I like that it's short. I think it, like, yep. for its time frame, it just, it fits, it, it hits you. And, uh, you know, like Jono, I had no idea what it was about until you said, Wes, but there was a part of me that was fine not knowing. I was just like, all right, we're having fun. <laughs> yep. Yeah. It does what it does. It doesn't overstay its welcome. Yeah. I think it's great. And, and I'd never heard it before. I never got around to playing this game. Shame on me. Um, so thank you for bringing this song on, Wes. I will I will always stand for Tokyo Mirage Sessions. It, it's close to my heart. Yeah, no doubt. It's really cute. It's upbeat. I mean, it's a completely impractical spacesuit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it it's a, and it, excuse you, it's an adorable impractical <laughs> spacesuit. A rabbit ears in a spacesuit. Insane. <laughs> Who approved this design? <laughs> I, I recommend everyone watch the uh, the YouTube video that accompanies the the song. Like the song will be on the tr- on in the episode, obviously, but the the music video is is cute. It fits very well with the tune. Okay, not to not to backtrack too much, but all that extra fabric cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars. <laughs> it's accumul. <laughs> it's it's contributing to the weight of the spaceship. <laughs> These things are supposed to be as light as possible. Every gram is accounted for, and you have rabbit ears on the space suits. But what value adorableness? I mean, what cost? What price do you put? You know what? It's a good That's argument. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You've won me over. Uh, well, this concludes our, our wholesome block, so I'm glad we ended on that note. It's very wholesome. It's the cat side of the internet. Yeah, right? Mm-hmm. This is this is the, the wrong word. In. Oh, all right. Do we feel like we're ready for our next block? Heck yeah! All I'm right, yeah, sure. yay! So our next block is uh, I dubbed it the travel block. So Jono's got the first song. Yeah. So the first song is called Train Train. It's from Fallout Four. It's sung by the character uh, named Magnolia in the game, and it's uh, it's an interesting tune. There are a few interesting tunes in Fallout Four like this, and we'll talk about that. Excellent. And then, Wes, your other pick is next. Uh, kind of taking the polar opposite approach of my last pick. Um, I picked the ending theme from Bastion called Setting Sail, Coming Home. Um, different vibes. Different vibes in a big way. Yeah, I can't wait to listen. Train, train. Soldier at war, it was a game game. Ah, but that was before we heard the bang bang. And then it started to change. We took the train, train to the bottom again. We heard the boom, boom. It was a horrible sound. And in the gloom, gloom, we went underground. Now in the room, room, we're jamming the sounds. Go round. 
So Fallout 4 gets a bad rap for a number of reasons. Personally, I love it. I think it's a great game. Um, I guess when it released, it was, well, I don't, I think, don't guess when it was released, it was buggy. It was buggy as hell because it's Bethesda. But uh, there, there was also some limited options to be evil, I guess you could say. And a lot of people took some issues with that. I think it's a terrific game. Um, and one of the cooler things about the game, like it's filled with just little, little touches and obviously little stories and characters, 
Uh, one of them is Magnolia, who is a lounge singer that you can find in the Third Rail, which is an underground bar in the town of Good Neighbor. And uh, she is played by Linda Carter of 1970s Wonder Woman fame. And she is, uh, like I said, she's a lounge singer, and she has about five or six songs in game that she will sing in the lounge. Uh, and they are, you know, they're, they're pastiches of 1940s and 50s jazz songs, which fit perfectly into the Fallout World's 1950s inspired aesthetic. Um, and yeah, this is one of them. It's called Train Train. And it sort of, I guess, follows what happened in the world of Fallout, which is, you know, you're training for a war and there was a bomb and now we're all dealing with the Fallout. Um, and uh, yeah, catchy, catchy tune. But I think one of my favorite things about this and the other songs is after you listen to them, they're dropped into the rotation of Diamond City Radio, which saves you from having to listen to Atom Bomb Baby and Bongo 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 for the thousandth time <laughs> as you're wandering the wastelands. It gives a little bit of variety to uh, to it, and it'll just add a couple extra songs, and you're just like, oh, thank God. <laughs> oh, thank God. Um, and, I mean, some other really cool things is Linda Carter apparently wrote all of these songs herself uh, and performed them, which is awesome, um, because good pastiche isn't easy, and I think that all of these songs are actually pretty good pastiche and the way I know is that they fit perfectly into the R Diamond City Radio rotation uh, without really feeling like they don't belong there. And I would love to see a lot more of this in future Fallout games. Like, they would never do this in a million years because it would cost them way too much and Bethesda's cheap. Um, but like Fallout 5, hire Scott Bradley, a po postmodern jukebox, oh. to just do the entire soundtrack of, <laughs> of retro pastiche versions of modern day... Uh, modern day hits that would be so much that would, fun that'd be so, so amazing good. yeah and then you would be like oh okay because it's very strange that fallout musical stylings uh stopped in 1950 even though it's this is the 2070s when the bombs fell so it'd be cool to hear like some some alternate versions of songs from our reality but in the style of uh the fallout universe I thought yeah that, that, that would kind of fit in an interesting way with it yeah, but I think it's a cool song. I think it's it actually it's catchy. It fits with the aesthetic. It sounds it sounds like it should sound based on the time period. Um, and the character of Magnolia is a fun character. She is one of the only characters in the game that you can uh, that you can sleep with who's not a companion. Uh, although you have to beat three very very high speech checks to do it. Um, and yeah, she's just a neat character. I, I like her a lot. I didn't know that last part. And I thought I did, like, everything in Fallout 4. Guess not. <laughs> oh, yeah, you can totally hit on her in the bar, and if you pass the three speech checks, uh, you'll wake up in the hotel with her. And she, like, is like, that was fun, but I'm in love with my music. Later! And then just leaves. Ah, uh, I'd want her to like, join oh. the party. <laughs> like, I, cool, I totally got used. Awesome. <laughs> it, it makes me so happy that it's Linda Carter, Carter too. Like, that's... <laughs> yeah, it's, it's funny. Also, the character uh, of Magnolia is... This isn't a spoiler because it has no bearing on the game itself. Uh, apparently, she's a synth. That kind of makes sense, right? She's, there's, she's part of the the underground railroad, right? No, she's not. She's just a singer. Uh, oh, yeah, she's she's a synth. If you if you kill her, she'll have a synth component in her. So she's she's a synth that had her memory wiped and replaced with uh, a new uh, a new persona. And I mean, again, going back to the are synths real people? Well, my opinion is obviously yes, but in the case of this. Yeah, because a synth, a synth is creating original music, and yes, and is being artistic, and those are not traits that a a fake AI machine like they seem to think synths actually are uh, can do. So yeah, uh, it, it's a, it's a nice touch that a synth is the one person who's creating art in this world. Yeah, wow, that adds a whole other level to this. Yeah, especially also if you think about the fact that this is you know basically pastiche it, it's kind of funny i was trying to explain the song to to mike and the first thing i did was compare it to like i think boogie woogie bugle boy or like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah unfortunately he hadn't heard that song so he hadn't heard boogie woogie bugle boy i know no mike come on mike <laughs> all right mike. everyone everyone has a free pass to uh to contact our editor-in-chief mike salbato <laughs> And mock it, him for not knowing the song Boogie oh, Woogie no, no. Bugle Boy. Just no, flood Patrick, him with YouTube Patrick. videos. Yeah, exactly. We don't want to mock him. We want to educate him. Send him YouTube videos of yes, Boogie very, Woogie very, Bugle very, Boy. Yes, many covers and be very nice about it. No Just mockery. wreck his inbox. 
<laughs> but yes, no matter what, Wreck is in box. Wow, you all are with terrible. The <laughs> I'm a, we all know I'm going to play it for him first anyway, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, and I guess that's the, the reason I'm telling that little story is because I think that that speaks to it being good pastiche that yeah. I immediately identified it and I didn't say, you know, yeah, it's kind of like that, but. Mm -hmm. Good pastiche is hard. There's a certain level of authenticity that is extremely difficult to replicate. And her voice, like her vocal performance, she's got the exact right, like, kind of. Uh, yeah, that tone. The tone, the charisma, the, I'm trying to think of it, not exactly inflection, the delivery, I guess. Yeah. She has it in the game, too. Like, the character of Magnolia is a pretty charismatic character. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And I just like Fallout 4. Again, I think it's a really good game. I think that if some of the people years ago, I, I think it's a good game to go back and give another chance to mod the crap out of it, but give it another chance. Oh, heck yeah. Yeah, I loved, I loved well, I love every Fallout game, but I love Fallout 4. <laughs> you love Fallout 76, do you? Oh, uh, excuse me. I haven't played that. I didn't count it as part of Fallout. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I hate it, and you like Saga, and I hate Saga, so you might love it, Patrick. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Just want to play the other 75 please, first. <laughs> please, please do not compare Fallout 76 to my beloved Saga series. <laughs> please. So, I want to give a shout out to the, the drum solo and the piano solo in this song, too. They're really fun. Yeah. <laughs> Sucker yeah. for a good drum solo. Yep. Magnolia's band. And and of that, in like that era and that style, like the sort of big band style, like big band swing having a good drum solo it always feels really good mm -hmm. no it's a good song and i mean she has like five other songs in the game as well and all of them are i mean to varying qualities of my enjoyment but all of them feel authentic so that's pretty cool and mm -hmm. i wish that fallout i wish that bethesda would do more of that in, in the next game i hope they do mm -hmm. i do too not that i don't want to hear bongo 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 again but you don't <laughs> and neither do i we've heard it enough exactly Give us, give us new old stuff. It's time to put Bongo to rest. I'm telling you, go to Scott Bradley and just hire Scott Bradley to I do know. what Scott Bradley does. I know, that actually is a great idea. Now I'm going to be thinking about that whenever anyone mentions Fallout. I'm going to be sad that I can't have it. Yeah, I mean, that's what he did with Bioshock Infinite. So yeah. him and a few other performers too. So it's like, it's a good idea, especially yeah. if you're trying to create a game that's out of time uh, or in the future, but a retro pastiche future. Mm -hmm. Doing that with modern day hits is a smart plan to create that that type of world yeah absolutely I, i'm looking forward to an equal parts equal parts looking forward to and dreading the fallout tv show because there have been leaks and some of them look awesome and some of them look terrible oh that makes me nervous because they are going for from what i've seen in the leaks they are going for exactly the aesthetic of the game uh exactly so they are not branching out or they're not making it more realistic or anything like everything is exactly as it looks in fallout 4 hmm. it's weird uh, it is risky because vault suits look weird in reality yeah yeah <sighs> just trying to imagine that i'm like yeah no no nope. i'm hopeful i mean amazon is doing it amazon has done some good work with science fiction in the last few years so it's true hopefully it's good um it will be the best thing to come out of fallout for a good long time and for a good long time still probably that is sad but true. Uh, seventy six got or seventy six got fixed a lot, but it's still not great in my opinion. Yeah, the core before, premise is shaky. So what can you do? Before we all get too sad about Fallout seventy six, let's yeah. uh, talk about Bastion. Oh yeah, let's talk about Bastion. <laughs> I love talking about Bastion. Do it, There's... Wes. <laughs> so yeah, this is uh, the ending theme uh, to Bastion and. What I absolutely love about it is that it's um, a combination of two in-universe songs. Um, Zaya's theme, which is... Um, uh, build That Wall. Build That Wall. Um, and then uh, Mother I'm Home, or Mother I'm Coming, Mother I'm Home. Um, Zolf's theme, um, which are like the first things that you hear from those characters. You hear them singing those songs before you actually um, see them in, in game. And both of them are these really somber... Um, stripped down songs, um, but they're absolutely beautiful. Uh, and then you get to to the end of it, and they combine both of those into something that managed to both feel epic, but still feel kind of somber and down, and, and um, that that bitter sweetness that that you feel at the you know throughout the entirety of Bastion, because Bastion is um, reveling in a in a 
kind of sorrowful, broken world. Um, and this song just kind of continues that and brings it to this this epic conclusion. Um, not only is it just you know incredibly nice to listen to, it's just a good sounding song. Um, thematically, it brings like every narrative thing the game has tried to do together, which impresses me. Um, and the it also allows me to kind of sneak two songs into here since it's kind of a combination of the two, um, the two songs that I think are the most like story essential songs in Bastion. Um, anyone who's played um, super giant games just knows the music is so vital. Um, and Bastion was kind of where we learned that for the first time, um, which is why yeah. I, I had to bring it to the table. Yes. Yeah. It, it didn't start with Hades. No, I agree. Darren Corb is the secret weapon of a company that doesn't need a secret weapon. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well put. Well put. I agree with that full, uh, full on, man. Yep. Like, it's just like the games are already good enough. Darren Corb is just like, oh, well, now you're just showing off. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like that fits into my description of a musical game. It it elevates the games in such a mm. significant way. And when the games are already such high tier to begin with... Um, yeah. That's an impressive trick to pull off. I like how my headcanon of this is that uh, this is one of uh, Eurydice and Orpheus's earliest hits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all all games prior to Hades, they the music was actually inspired by a muse, right? So yeah. Eurydice. I just realized I brought two duets to the table today, and I'm not mad at it. No, nope. no one's disappointed with that choice. <laughs> And the they secret, are very different duets. They are very different Extremely duets. different, yeah. Yes, this is the secret to a musical game is duets. Um, <laughs> it's such yeah. a remarkably atmospheric song. It's, mm -hmm. I mean, Darren Corb's Bread and Butter, uh, Bread and Butter is, um, I feel like it's melancholy without sadness. Like his songs yeah. aren't sad, but there's a certain melancholy that comes along with it, which is evocative and really, really hits you emotionally. Yeah, it's very do tumble, very kind of almost wistful yeah wistful nostalgic a little bit but not yeah it doesn't give you that extremely sad it's not it doesn't bring you down no yeah it's it's not giving you a window into a mood so much as it's giving you a window into a worldview mm. um where like that that kind of melancholy feels like you can you can live your life in that way and still not be negative still not um you, you can see all of the things that happen in the world that are good bad and everything in between and still exist with that knowledge Mm -hmm. um, and this might be reading way too deep into it, but uh, what else do I do? But that's the it's, show. <laughs> it's, it's very like uh, musical radical acceptance. That's yes. right. That's exactly. right. We're, we're, we're bringing our DBT distress tolerance <laughs> skills to the forefront. Um, and yeah, radical acceptance in the form of Darren Korb songs feels really good to me. Yeah, honestly, um, I'm with you on there. Yeah, so I had forgotten this. So Build That Wall is probably that and maybe Good Riddance from Hades are probably my two favorite Darren Korb songs. I had forgotten about uh, this ending track where Build That Wall and uh, Zorf's theme are, are, are given a mashup, but it's not like a... Like, it's a very clean mashup. I wonder if he wrote the two melodies knowing he was going to be doing this because it really feels like it. Yeah. I think you would have to, because of how clean it's, it, there's a sort of clean call and response happening throughout the song. Yep. Mm. And I made uh, a note about the call and response and that's, I think that's, it feels good, really good. good. Too. Yeah. Well, um, well, good riddance is a, the duet is it's all the, it's all the same. It's, um, it's both, both Orpheus and Eurydice sing, sing the exact same. Yeah, I'm It's probably... just a minor third apart. Um, right, no, I, I'm just thinking of timing, probably not oh. like the actual words. Just oh, like the... yeah, 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 yeah. I follow now, sorry. No, all good. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I really do like th the way this was put together, and, and I'm disappointed in myself for forgetting, given I own the Bastion soundtrack, um, probably in two different forms, probably CD and digital, um, that... <laughs> As much as I listened to Build That Wall, I forgot there's a there's sort of a, a more complete and superior form of it waiting at the end. Now, when I think Bastion, this is the song I think, and Bastion has a lot of good songs to think about. That's a good point. I I have a question. Did did Transistor get a song like this? 
I know Darren Corp wrote the music for it, but I can't think of the song attached to it. Every every game has at least one one big vocal number at the end, but I can't recall for Transistor. I don't remember the name of it, but I could hum it off the top of my head, but I'm okay. not going to <laughs> <laughs> because podcasts are an audio medium and listening to someone hum is audio poison. <laughs> I was just thinking of like the different Supergiant games and I was thinking that might also be a good one to pick just to kind of show his work and show all these kinds of things. And it's got a character who's a singer, right? It's We All Become is the one that I was looking for, just for the record. Yeah. We should uh, we should do a Corb Fest episode. We'll invite Darren Corb on, and we'll just pull songs from all four games. And, well, depending on how long it takes, five games because of Hades, too. <laughs> but yeah, Transistor and Pyre are often overlooked, but they are also great games with great music. That's what I've heard. I haven't, I haven't played Pyre to completion yet. Uh, I've beaten Transistor once. I'm about halfway through Pyre, and I just started it like three weeks ago. Ooh. Okay. Yeah, I'm trying to get my super giant fix before Hades 2. Kind of an underappreciated game because it's a little different from their usual. Yes, it is. It is different. Well, I appreciate you representing super giant here because they definitely do some musically interesting things. Also, uh, this has nothing to do with the music, but it has to do with Darren Cord. Did you guys know that for a long time, with for about the first six months after the game out, game came out... Um, for like two different categories of speedrun, Darren Korb was the record holder, like the world record holder for two different speedrun categories. For oh, wow. uh, oh, that makes me so happy. Yeah, this is knowledge for his I own needed game. today, Patrick. Yeah. Oh, that's that's amazing. Yeah. The, I remember the year the game came out, they were showing the game at GDQ and someone mentioned like, who has the record for this? And they're like, Oh, we think it's the composer, Darren, and they're like, Oh yeah, it is. Just <laughs> oh, really that's funny. funny. That yeah. is damn funny. Yeah, well, it just shows dedication to the project and to the game, and it's and the fact that it's even someone who's worked on it that long would want to play it that much. It's you know the game is that good. Yeah, it speaks volumes. Well, speaking of volume, ah <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, we we are going into our uh, music contains the world block. Yeah, and you know it's amazing how a soft song can can change the world and how a loud song can change the world. And I think we're <laughs> getting a little bit of both uh, with this next block. We are. And I'll go into a little bit um, about the game itself around my track. So my track is a, Your Truth is My False, a great Matoy Sakuraba song title from Eternal Sonata. And uh, for me, I picked a, a very complicated song title, <laughs> uh, which all of these song titles are complicated from the first Arts and Alico. Uh, it's ex- exec paja orica ex- ex- hashtag orica extracting. <laughs> Excellent. All right, let's go see what these what these songs are about. <laughs>
So my track is some battle music from Eternal Sonata, which is uh, a fascinating musical game. Uh, I referenced it very early on in the episode when I talked about um, games centered around composers <laughs> uh, with apparently, you know, JRPGs occurring in their in their fever dreams. Um, so Eternal Sonata follows the pianist and composer Chopin um, as he is sick and actually dying. He died early at age 39. Um, and so this game is just kind of imagining just kind of a very vivid kind of fantasy story, JRPG kind of playing out and showing some ideas about how do you change the world? How, how are you remembered when you know you're going to die? Those sorts of ideas in this colorful JRPG world uh, interposed with some lovely Chopin performances um, and meticulous facts about his life. It's really odd, really interesting game. Maybe not the most fun to play, but and I, I recently learned that like all of the, the the entire localization was checked and proofread by the Chopin Society. Um, oh wow! Which was fascinating to me, just to make sure that information was correct. So you know they they take his life and work really seriously and. The director basically all but said that this game exists to kind of bring the worlds of classical music and gaming together that might not always intersect. So yeah, I always thought it was a fascinating project. I'm, you know, I remember when it was first announced and it coming into being, and I was super, super fascinated. Um, fun fact: the Japanese title of the game is Trusty, Trusty Bell. Bell, Chopin no Yume, which means Chopin's Dream, is the subtitle with it. So. The thing that I least like about uh, the localization was the choice to give it such a bland name as Eternal Sonata. <laughs> like, we need one more game that references the concept of eternity. That is true. Like, just, no. Like, or like, um, I don't even want to get into how much I hate the infinity, eternity, like, superlative terms <laughs> for your RPGs or like Final Fantasy like they you know what they, but they've got to be superlative they've got to be way out there <laughs> or not you know I mean you could just have a literature club um that's true or games we need more games with sharps in the title oh, yes we, th- that I'm I, I could vote for more sharps in the title that's my you big takeaway for game, today. you just picked a game that's basically a directory or flats like or- Final Fantasy A flat <laughs> So I'd play. I would play Final Fantasy A flat. That'd be a good game. Um, I don't know. I feel I like it fell a bit flat. <laughs> oh, but I'm. That was good. That was good. But anyway, Eternal Sonata, Eternal Sonata slash Trusty Bell. Uh, great game. Great concept. And I think the thing that I love about this track, specifically that you've chosen, um, is that even though it's a Motoi Sakuraba composition, um, I feel like it does a really good job channeling. A lot of what makes Chopin great, and you know, Chopin composed for a lot of um, different uh, configurations of instrument. Uh, he did a, he did a lot of piano solo. He yep. did plenty of full orchestra, and then he did a lot of really interesting sort of chamber work where he'd be like, "All right, we're going to do piano, flute, cello. All right, let's go." Yeah, this feels like a weird, interesting chamber piece to me. So I'm glad you brought that up because that was something I was going to mention that instrumentation post. Post Chopin, a lot of people started doing this. Late Romantic era, era and early 20th century, this became more and more common to just, all right, pick three or four instruments and go to town. And Chopin, um, more than I think, more than the other Romantic period artists, um, think uh, Beethoven, uh, Franz Liszt, um, uh, Schumann and Schubert, like. Brahms, they all did stuff that was really cool, but I think Chopin played with instrumentation more than all the others, and I think Sakuraba really channeled that idea well in this track and a few others on the OST. I love how it's not completely bombastic, but it does have that really kind of like fast feel. It almost feels like a dance, yes. and it has great transitions to kind of indicate like different phases of battle, and it actually like kind of reminded me of the just listening of the the weird gameplay mechanic where enemies and your party can do different things based on whether they're in the light or in shadow. Oh yeah. 
Yeah, I feel like this track kind of reflected. I don't know. I forgot I got that about vibe that mechanic. Yeah. yeah, that's so smart. But I felt like the different sections of this track kind of like made me imagine that, like, okay, we're fighting in the light, we're going really fast, and then oh, things are slowing down. Uh oh, we got pushed into the shadow. You know, I don't know. I feel uh, that. I feel that. I had a very interesting, interesting experience when I was listening to this song for the first time because I haven't played Eternal Sonata, uh, and one of the things I do when I'm coming on Rhythm Encounter is I always put the songs. I try not to look at what games the songs are from or the names of the songs. I try to put the songs in my iPhone and then just listen to them blind. And if I recognize one, that's one thing. But otherwise, I just listen to them as they are. So I have a an unbiased instant response Ooh, I of like that. what a song is like. Um, and I listened to this one, and my first thought was, wait a minute, what Ace Attorney is this Pursuit theme from? <laughs> <laughs> nice. Because it has, if you, I was listening to it, I was like, this sounds a lot like a, like an Ace Attorney Pursuit theme. Like, in terms of structure and everything, like, it just feels like that kind of tune, um, which is, uh, which I, I really enjoyed it, but at the same time, I was like, yeah, and then I looked at the title, and I was like, Your Truth is My False, that's even a good title for an Ace Attorney song. <laughs> it is. Especially as part of the trial sequences. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> and the Pursuit theme. Yeah, actually, j- as soon as you said Pursuit theme, like, it, that clicked with me, like, yes, that would actually work. Um... And those, you know, the entire trial suites, though some of them can veer towards rock, there is there is something of a, I mean, even the, in the song titles, like, they'll say, like, Allegro or Moderato. Like, Which is every single character in this in Eternal Sonata's name. Right, All their names are music terms. Music, Italian music terms, yep. yeah. Um, but, like, and now that I'm saying it, we, we could have pulled in uh, an Ace Attorney song, because, you know... The trials themselves have this very. Um, the music for it has this sort of overflow of, of uh, a sort of concerto experience. You you could make an argument for it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you could also there was the guitar serenade, I believe, from Ace Attorney Four uh, mm-hmm. is a uh, is a full you know musical number. That's true too, and and a key part of the of the uh, of a case in that game. That's right. Yep. Good old Apollo Justice. Oh, so. Uh, to tie in really quickly with how this kind of like fits into the music can change the world block. So Eternal Sonata is like one of the more interesting plot points is kind of looking at how different people deal with their mortality. Um, so the main female protagonist, um, it turns out in Chopin's dream world, uh, if you have magical powers, that means you're, you are going to die soon. Um, so she has to deal with her imminent mortality and she chooses to do this by she wants to be remembered by being kind and helping as many people as she can before she goes so she starts she notices that a lot of people around her are suffering and so that's how she kind of gets roped into the typical jrpg plot there's a castle lord who is being very greedy and there's kind of some suspicious stuff going on and the more you go into it and like I think it's the game that's most complete form you kind of get a hint at the fact that he's amassing power not just because he's a completely you know one note villain but because that's actually his way of wanting to be remembered it's the only way he thinks he'll be able to be remembered is like having all this wealth and amassing all this power that's uh that's dark and sad yeah. for that person it really is and it, it, I don't know, for, for me, it, in a way, like, it made him a little bit more sympathetic. Just... Yeah. Yeah, people do wild stuff faced with their own mortality. Mm-hmm. Man, I need to play that game again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. And, you know, all this is coming about because Chopin himself, you know, it's his, I guess, colorful JRPG processing of his own mortality. Yep, man. That changes the world, yo. Yep. There's no way to transition into this song. This title is impossible <laughs> to transition into. Yeah. Uh, let's. Well, hey, Patrick, let's... run exe. <laughs> yeah. Padja. <Yes. laughs> Orica. Yeah. Run dot exe backslash backslash something. Exe yeah. Padja. Orca. So so let's let's talk about the game really quick and and why these song titles are as they are. Oh, thank God, because I could not find it. I, I was like, wh- how does the music even work in this game? Yeah. So um, if you watch the opening credit oh real actually real quick let's start from the very beginning so this is a game developed by gust 
um, who creates the Atelier series. And right after creating the first Atelier Iris, which is the first game that came to America, um, they got to work on this side project series that turned out to be a trilogy. Uh, plus they had this weird spiritual follow-up called Arno Surge and a cell phone only game similar to it called CL No Surge. Um, but the Artanelico games are about a world where um, the, the power to sing, uh, to, to vocalize and sing, uh, is also a power that can sort of bend the rules of the natural world, thus making it something like magic. And for some reason, uh, humanity has lost the like literal ability to sing. And I don't know if it's, it has something to do with the vocal cords or they just lack inspiration or what, but it's like humans can't sing, but these uh, sort of mystical, spiritual, but also robotic uh uh people who i think in the first game it's all women but in as of the second or third game there's guys too but they're known as reva tail which is a german word r-e-y-v-a-t-e-i-l um they have the power to sing and with their singing power they have different functions in the world so the technology of the world can be controlled and manipulated uh through the power of song and so two of the central characters in the game are Misha and Orica, and they're like the first two characters that you meet and they can sing and they can you know heal people of illness and they can control the elevator of this giant tower that the game is sort of based around you're all up in the sky because humanity essentially destroyed the world probably with atom bombs or something so you live above the cloud line on this tower right and uh all that's left is porn and cats all that's left is porn and cats and uh so there's a lot of singing going on but because the singing is done through these sort of mechanical robotic entities uh the idea that we control them like computers and can cause them to sing on command and that the, the singing command that they bring uh interfaces with computers and uh robots and other technology that's kind of why the songs are named as they are so it's kind of like it's a thing. So that Paja is just sort of a, a bastardized Romaji thing. It's meant to be purge, P-U-R-G-E. So it's a mm. purge command. Um, and so the each of the two main characters, uh, Orica and Misha, at different times in the game have to use a purge command to delete this big, ridiculous virus that's trying to take over uh, the tower. And so each of them has this really awesome song for when they like um first activate like their strongest powers in battle and there's an animation cutscene associated with each one and um so this is orica's and orica is sort of the actually sort of the softer or sweeter of the two misha's very rebellious and uh bitter uh whereas orica's sort of more devoted to like the organization slash church that makes up the Reva tale and the people that are trying to keep this tower functioning. She's very much a healer. She's very much interested in supporting other people. And um, so this is her song where she extracts like the most powerful entity within herself to, t to purge the virus. And um, I think hopefully we can put this in the show notes like we do with uh, the Tokyo Mirage song. There's a lyrics video that goes with this because um, the the song is sung in Japanese, but it's also sung in the hymnos language, uh, and that is a fictional language uh, invented by the game's creator Akira Tsuchiya and the vocalist that continues through all the games, Akiko Shikata. And um, it's a mix of Latin, especially Latin that would be used in like catholic churches there's a lot of latin mass language used throughout but there's also mm -hmm. some gaelic and english mixed in mm -hmm. um so you get these choir vocals that will sing in the hymnos language and then the lead sung by um Orica's character is in japanese primarily and if you follow the the lyrics um it's this it's this very like intense song about um yeah i mean the word purging it's the idea that like the virus that's in the tower is a sin that needs to be removed and we're going to bring the world back to life and 
you know, challenge the darkness and wake from our sleep and all this kind of language, very, very religious and spiritual in nature. Um, and I think, you know, I didn't, I didn't know any of the lyrics when I first heard this song in 2006. And I only learned these lyrics maybe a year or two ago. Um, I always thought the song was powerful. It's very energetic. Um, it's one of my favorite songs to listen to the, uh, the looping music box part, which I, to me reminds me of Bjork's pagan poetry, but sped up. Um, There's just, I don't know, there's so much power and energy and emotion here. And now that I know what the song's actually about, I like it even more. It was cool listening to the song and like, I can't speak any of these languages, but I could pick out various words that I might recognize, like Mm -hmm. uh, Mia Culpa at one point, for example. Mia Culpa and Spiritus Sanctu for Holy Spirit. Yep. And then Hymnos, that's Greek, I think? Yeah, the word itself, Hymnos, is the Greek word for him, yeah. So again, there's they they pulled a lot of these like ancient roots into a you know you know post apocalyptic world with robot girls that know how to sing and oh, so, humans don't. Uh, I guess it's a kind of a chaos precursor, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> there's been a lot about a lot of talk about AI and music today. Yeah, that's a good point. Something's going on there. Robot girls, and that's what it's all heading to. <laughs> We better be ready. Yeah, Mag- Magnolia would have been great in Artanelico. It's not that yeah. we're not he- we're not heading towards Arnold Schwarzenegger and the Terminator. We're heading towards magical singing robot girls. <laughs> I, for one, welcome our magical <laughs> robot girls, robot singing girl overlords. I imagine that many people uh, listening to this do too. That's yes. uh, a very sympathetic argument for AI. I think. Yeah, oh. Ken Brockman and me and a lot of other people. <laughs> you got any thoughts on it, Wes? Or are you are you feeling? I feel like so much of it has been has been said, um, but yeah, Artanelico is is one of those kind of forgotten musical games that um, really deserves a little bit more love, especially in the modern era. Um, I fully and, agree with you. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe someday we'll get some kind of uh, ports, remasters, whatever, and get a chance to play some of those those old fantastic Gust games again. Well, they got to run out of Talia games eventually, right? Nope. They're you'd go you'd think that, wouldn't you? <laughs> you'd think, but I'm looking at their wiki page article right now, and holy crap! Yeah, they, that's that franchise is killing it, and the fact that they're remaking the first game, which is, you know, in many ways very outdated compared to the mechanics in the franchise now, and they're bringing that remake to America, like that speaks to how well Atelier is done. I'm very happy about it. But yeah, the Artanelico trilogy is something I, if someone just repackaged that with a little bit of a little bit of HD fine tuning, I'd buy it. A little bit of HD fairy dust. Mm-hmm. A little HD fairy dust, yeah. I'd take it. Sprinkle I, it on there. You know, hearing a little bit more about just to go back for a second, hearing more about the series itself, I mean I kinda knew the the basics, but it actually I think makes musically it makes the song make more sense because you have this, the background vocals are kind of, I don't want to exactly say atonal, but kind of. And then you have some kind of vague beeps and bloops to get kind of like the technological element. So you get like both kind of the dystopian and the technological and then with her over most of it. And then you get this really cool like moment of silence <clears throat> in the middle where she says, I just keep singing. And yep. then it goes on. <laughs> uh, da, da, dun, da, da, da. Da-da. There, I did musical hell um, or audio hell because I hummed it. Um, yes. So, yeah, what I love about the lyrics is, you know, since the songs are thought of as like commands executed in, in like a computer system, and then you think about like what the lyrics are saying, like these songs, I, they're like chants. They're it's like a it's like you're casting a spell. It's something between you know what a priest or a witch would sing you know like it's really like powerful like these words are demanding something come into existence or something occur yeah this one i mean this one got intense it was like yes release yourself to death and go away yeah We're like purging you it's like Whoa, okay yeah it's yeah it's yeah this calling and like demanding like the virus either die disappear or somehow go into exile it's the exorcism song it's fine it is the exorcism song um some some people prefer Misha's, and Misha's extracting song is very powerful, and it has that. Um, Akiko Shikata has this very like powerful uh, reverb voice that she developed just 
as an effect for this franchise. Oh, wow. Um, and it always like blows people over when they hear it. But I think she does it better in the second game than in the first. So that's why I went with the more sort of peppy sound of uh, Misha's ex- or of Orca's extracting. <sighs> All right. Well, we've been here for a while. Thank you for going on this journey with me. Uh, any final thoughts before we get into housekeeping? I'd like there to be more musical games. Yeah. I think that music is, I don't want to use the word underused because clearly all games have music and some games have incredible music, but as a gameplay mechanic or as a hook, I think that there's more that can be done and explored with music. Absolutely. Just outside of rhythm games and things like that. That's not what I'm talking about. Yeah, I mean, they're really neat, thoughtful ways, like Darren Corb is a great example of building these sort of themes that build into an amazing duet. That's like such a payoff at the end, and it flows with the story, you know? Even being thoughtful about those sorts of things or how character themes fit together. Yeah. Yeah. I also love the idea of of simple melodies creating something happening like we talked about in Loom, and of course, Mm -hmm. Ocarina of Time does that, and other Zelda games will use that, like input a couple notes and then a thing happens. Um, it's so I, satisfying. I do like that mechanic and would like to see people find more clever ways to, to throw that into things. Um, maybe into a game with like a real time battle system or a turn based battle system. I don't know. I'm spitballing, but yeah. Also uh, my final thought is um, you all have impeccable musical taste. Hillary, <laughs> oh. Wes, Jono, uh, a lot of these songs I, I had either forgotten about or had never heard before, and I just feel enlightened, and I thank you. Oh, A gamer I was meant to be. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think of another line for that. A gamer I was meant to be. Uh, screw the consoles, yay PCs. Pass the controller over to me. <laughs> That's good, too, yeah. I guess uh, it depends. Screw the consoles, love my PC would be a capital G gamer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So there are two versions. <laughs> there we go. Uh, all right. Well, again, I had so much fun with this. I think we had a range of tracks that gave us some insight into the topic, and you really can't ask for more than that. And I enjoyed all of them. So games that made their debut today, uh, several. Um, Chris Monkey Island, Fallout 4, Loom, Artinelico, and Rhapsody. That's more no, than wait, no. half. Rhapsody didn't. I'm sorry. I don't know why that's there. Yeah. Well, half. Yes. Four of the eight tracks were from <laughs> games we haven't featured on Rhythm before. That's wild. Yeah. That is a whole bunch. And then coming next on Rhythm, we are going to have a jazz and funk episode, which I'm greatly looking forward to. Um, and there's an episode on Dragon Quest. And then there's also going to be another interview episode. Yay. I love those. Yeah. And... You would know all about that, given that it was mostly you, but I was also there doing oh, the interview. We were doing it together. <laughs> Are we going to say who it was? With, yep, Cara Comparetto. Cara Comparetto. She's got a, an incredible YouTube channel and Twitch community. Uh, you want to see piano and other piano instruments, like pipe keyboard instruments, pipe organ and uh, harpsichord. She does some really incredible covers of really great game music mostly rpgs a lot of final fantasy and Chrono. yeah there's some great classic rpg music on there so look her up look forward to the interview um if you have any comments for us you can email us at music at rpgfan.com um as for my contact info uh the best way to reach me is hillary a at rpgfan.com and pat what's the best way to reach you the best way to reach me is through twitter my handle is gameadactyl that is uh the word game, G-A-M-E, the letter O, and Dactyl. Figure that last part out for yourself. Uh, You can also reach me, uh, P. Gan, that's my last name, G-A-N-N, at RPGfan.com. But I'm more likely to get back to you quickly if you find me on Twitter. Great. And how about you, Wes? Uh, Easiest way to find me is on Twitter, at Wes Iliff. Simple as that. Great. And how about you, Jono? Uh, You can find me at jlogan at rpgfan.com, or you can find me on Mastodon at Logan at mastodon.social. Perfect. All right. Uh, In addition to Rhythm, we have some lovely other podcasts, and I'm going to let Jono talk about what's going on with Random. What is happening with Random? When's this posting? This is posting... Okay, so last week would have been our uh, our big Not E3 extravaganza episode where we were talking about all of the news that came out of... uh, 
Summer Game Fest and uh, Guerrilla Showcase and a bunch of other shows. So all of those shows, everything up to Sunday, uh, which means that we'll be missing out on the Capcom Showcase, the RGG Showcase, a few others, because there's a lot of news coming out. Um, but yeah, so check that out if you want to uh, keep informed about what's coming up. And I think next week, uh, I, I believe there is a... Is it Final Fantasy A flat? Was it? There's a Final Fantasy game coming out, I think, <laughs> that might be talked about. Right, A flat. Yep. Hopefully, it will not be flat. It will not be flat. I mean, <laughs> flat. Everything, everything I've heard suggests otherwise. So, mm. look forward to that. Um, all right. We also have retro, um, and they will have recently posted an episode about emotional game moments, um, and then. Their next thing is a game journal on Final Fantasy VI. Yay. Yay. The classic. I'm really surprised they hadn't had one yet, but yeah. yeah it'll be fun. Time. It'll be fun to listen to. Um, and then let's see. Please also, you know, take a look at RPGfan.com. Um, take a look at our social media. Take a look at our Twitch. We do a lot of different things and it's all fun. You'll learn a lot. I know I do just being part of the site. So I encourage you to, you know, check out the site as a whole. Um, please also consider reviewing us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, your preferred method. Uh, those subscriptions and reviews help us a lot. They help all of our podcasts. We really appreciate them. And lastly, we're going to end with a bonus track. So would you like to tell us what that is, Pat? Uh, yes, I will. Um, so a great, I mentioned this right at the start of the show, a great series with great musical moments is sakura wars because in every game they're putting on uh musical theater productions between uh lengthy strategy rpg battles with mecha mecha things can't remember what they call them uh but uh this song is the ending theme from sakura wars 5 also known as sakura wars so long my love in america Um, and it features the entire cast uh of characters from the game and the song is called kiss me sweet great let's go listen and thank you all for listening and i don't want to steal the good luck catchphrase but wherever you are um steal mine (laughs) you can steal mine whatever you're listening to enjoy exactly yeah that's what i was going for whatever you're listening to enjoy and keep finding that interesting game music and interesting use of music in games bye こんな素敵な恋を誰も知らないだろうこの街の誰もがこんな甘い思いを誰も知らないだろう Kiss me sweet, 
Tonelico. Yo ho ho. Ar- <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so funny. Ar- Tonelico. <laughs> well, if you need to find this one, look for the part where all four audio tracks peak. Yeah, right? Yeah. Ar- oh, Tonelico. Look-